Anyway, but let me ask you another question. This is a question for Andy because this is important. When pertuzumab first came out, um, I think people were concerned because it was only approved by the FDA for use with docetaxel. Yep. And your group it was really, I think, at the forefront of pushing everybody to be able to use it with paclitaxel. And so can you comment a little bit on that? Because it now has compendia approval and we're allowed to use it with paclitaxel. Yep, yep. So, um, I mean, in, indeed, weekly paclitaxel tends to be uh, our favored monotherapy and also uh, in combination with trastuzumab as a first-line option. So uh, Dr. Chow Dang led us in a uh, phase two trial where we um, explored the efficacy and safety of that regimen. Um, so it's 80 per meter squared weekly uh, paclitaxel with <clears throat> um, standard uh, dosing of trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And indeed, at this ASCO meeting, she'll be uh, presenting this as a poster. So uh, when I give taxane and dual, dual HER2 antibodies, that tends to be how I, how I give it. I would say that for the, the patient who has had adjuvant paclitaxel and relapses you know, a year, a year and a half later, then, then I'll, I'll probably favor using docetaxel, as in um, Cleopatra. Patients who tolerate docetaxel well can then come in every three weeks, which is really nice uh, for patients with metastatic disease. Uh, the issue I always have with that, and you know, I think we all, we, many of us tend to use weekly paclitaxel first unless they are in that situation that you mentioned, or have transportation issues is because sometimes I have horrendous toxicity and I can't predict it. And so that's part of the issue, you know, people whose hair doesn't grow back or have issues like that. So it's nice to have an alternative option. So would anybody use, if this woman, say, received, you know, weekly paclitaxel, uh, pertuzumab and trastuzumab uh, for, say, six months, eight months, had a stability response, went on an aromatase inhibitor, and now it's a year later, um, how would you treat her? If she progressed, say her liver metastasis suddenly became larger, how, what would you do next? Any comments? TDM1. Mm -hmm. TDM1. Yep. Okay. She's not resistant to yeah. a taxane. You could right? just add the taxane back in. But then their hair falls out again. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Would well, people switch? True. I mean, it's a year. I mean, so, all right. I, well, let's make it harder. Let's make it like a year, say, 18 months later. You know, she's just been on stable hormonal therapy. You know, and this happens. I think we all have patients in our practices mm -hmm. where someone's, I mean, would you just reintroduce the chemo or switch to TDM1? But what about and switching to a hormone agent? Because if she's having a little progression, you could agent. just give another hormone And we're going to hear about uh, Everolimus for Bolero it's, 3 may become an option for her too coming out, the wild, wild coming out west. of the ASCO. <laughs> well, but that's what people need. You know, you'd be surprised. In, in <laughs> yeah. Pittsburgh, we're really, you know, we're really focusing, and I'm sure nationally people are doing this too, on treatment guidelines. Uh, where we've tried, at least in metastatic breast cancer, to pick at least the first and the second line of therapy. Um, it really gets very hard after this third line. You can't really pick, you know, because there's so many different combinations. I know probably U.S. Oncology's tried the same thing. Mayo. You know, Mayo's trying the same thing. How do you pick after the second or third line? Well, what to give? It is the Wild West, Andy. Yeah, well, one thing yeah. I can say that because of the complexities, uh, certainly in the HER2 positive setting, is that ASCO has uh, gathered a group of people to uh, develop uh, guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, so formal ASCO guidelines for her duplicity metastatic breast cancer, and the team is coalescing quite well, and there will be some guidelines written. We have no. also guidelines for metastatic ER positive breast cancer, and one thing I'll say about the ASCO guidelines is they work very hard to make those committees well balanced, reduce conflict of interest, yeah. really go through the literature carefully. So these guidelines, I think, are although it's a bit of a moving target, will be very helpful. Yep. Yeah. Probably before we leave this case, and we probably should, um, is worth just reminding folks of the TANDEM trial, which was really the study that established the um, role of trastuzumab and aromatase inhibitor over aromatase inhibitor alone in uh, ER positive, HER2 positive postmenopausal women. Uh, we also haven't mentioned the Johnston uh, study of letrozole and lapatinib, mm -hmm. where adding lapatinib to an AI also resulted in a significant improvement in progression free survival. So, um, just to give this some context. Sure. Yeah, yeah and that's an all options. oral approach that if you tolerate lapatinib well is not a bad option no, for patients. I would agree. So let's change.